Hey, Hersha, now I just lost your feed. Wait, are you there? I'm here. There you are. Hi. Okay, Hi. let me check if we're live. Um, so sometimes if the internet goes out, the video might go away, but the audio usually still works. Okay. It's so good to see you. And yes, we're it's live. Good to see you. Um, live on Facebook and live here. People want to join us on Crowdcast as well. Um, anyone who's joining, they can post questions and I'll try to read them as best I can as we go along. Anyway, it's great to see you. It's in good Hong to see Kong. you. So I am in, I'm in California. It's like five o'clock in the evening and you're in Hong Kong. And what time is it? It's eight o'clock in the morning. Eight o'clock in the morning on the next day. You're, you're yes. Saturday. We're Saturday morning, Saturday morning. We're still on Friday. So. <laughs> I find that so weird. I know. We're definitely behind, you know, here. We're behind in the West. Um, anyway, it's great to see you again. Yeah. And uh, I wondered, like, usually I ask my guests to, if they're interested in leading a centering. Are you yes. open to that? Very. Okay. Just yes. a couple minutes. All right. I would like to friends? actually offer a, um, a mantra for right. healing for the world. The Maham Ritchie and Jaya Mantra. Mm. Oh. Om Trayambakam Yajamahe Sugandhim Pushtivartanam Urvaru Kamiva Pandanam Rityur Mukshiya Mamrata Om Shanti 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 Om Shanti. Thank you. Om Shanti. Thank you. And for people who don't know, do you mind explaining that mantra? I think maybe people don't yes. know it. Even though it's, it's quite ancient, that one. Yeah, it's a very old um, mantra. I've actually been chanting it since I was a child. Uh, it's a beautiful one for healing. It's, the meaning of the mantra is about the universe is abundant and our world is has enough to nurture and sustain us. And when we can connect with the grand scheme of things, we are not so attached to our physical bodies, our physical attachments, our material attachments. And by chanting the mantra, it allows us to sever those attachments to realize that actually we are more than just this body and more than just this mind. And it's designed to bring great comfort and healing. And yeah, we need and healing in our world, especially at this time. <laughs> yeah, and it also, uh, it's a blessing for um, travel and illness or change, you know, right. transitions and especially death. So it's, a, mm -hmm. it's about, right, like overcoming the fear of death. It's yes, exactly. Teaching. Yeah. Um, so I didn't really introduce you. Do you mind maybe introducing yourself a little bit? Okay. Oh. Hello, things? everybody. I'm Hersha. Um, I'm a yoga teacher from Hong Kong. I've been teaching oh, almost 20 years now. <gasps> wow. Um, I never actually intended to be a yoga teacher. I went to take my teacher training just for myself, purely selfishly. But then when I started teaching and talking to people, the people that came to me always had some sort of a physical or health issue, some limited mobility. And through working with them, I found a sense of purpose. And so I now teach yoga for people with disabilities and special needs. I have a school of teacher training in Hong Kong which offers successful yoga. Mm -hmm. And I also run a small charity in Hong Kong called Yama Foundation. <laughs> <laughs> and Yama is actually obviously the first limb of the eight limbs of yoga, but it actually stands for making 
yoga, art, and meditation accessible. Yeah. And we run community outreach programs across Hong Kong in five areas. People with disabilities and special needs, people living in care homes, people living in poverty, people with um, mental health issues, and people in prisons. Mm. Wow, amazing. That's incredible. Thanks. Thanks for sharing. And you're also our, you're a trainer for accessible yoga. You lead the accessible yes, yoga. Yes, I am. Training, you know, which is exciting. Um, I, I, I trust you so much that I have you lead the whole program in my absence. Actually, you probably do a better job. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> I don't know about that. I don't know. Um, anyway, I, and I've known you for a long time and you know, we have, we're from the same tradition of integral yoga. So we have a lot of um, you know, like common training and understanding about yoga. And, um, and I'd love that you also have this interest in accessibility. So it's, always, it's been so great getting to know you over the years. And I'm glad you can finally be here. We've been talking about doing this for a long time. I know, but it's perfect, perfect timing. Okay, so um, what we're gonna, I, I think the main topic is just about your work really, about accessible yoga in Hong Kong. And I, I know that, um, you know, Hong Kong has been in the news a lot actually, at least in the US, um, really for almost, I would say for over a year. Like there's so many things have gone on there. Um, right. And it's been amazing actually to see it so well covered uh, in the US, I've been surprised, but um, a lot of political problems and challenges, um, like kind of like a, it seems like a, the Chinese government, um, well, the Chinese government took over again from the UK, right? And then right. they're kind of um, cha making changes there. Which right. Is challenging, right? Yeah, and I think any kind of change whether political or social or just even moving house, any kind of change is really, really difficult. And, you know, Hong Kong is actually going through major, major changes right now. And some people are okay to embrace them and a lot of people are not okay to embrace them. And whether, you know, the situation is what it is, we can only do as best as we can. And I think what is the most important in terms of the work that we do is to create welcoming spaces. I think there's so many divides in society, especially last year when the civil unrest happened. You know, there were the people that were protesting for our fundamental rights and freedoms yeah. to the point where it did get a little bit radical. And families were torn apart and, you know, mm. people were so passionate and it got to the point where no one was allowed to actually express their views one way or the other. Mm. Whether you were pro-China or you weren't at that point. Mm -hmm. And this is what brought a lot of divide. And this is where healing needed to happen. And this is what I felt yoga had to be accessible in that space where yes everybody has free to express their beliefs but i am not going to discriminate who walks in through the door based on what they believe because if you look at yoga it's it's about all encompassing no matter anybody's age ability culture background and then when you bring these political beliefs in are you, you know, the job is to create that safe space for everybody to practice and go within whatever is happening inside of them. And this was really, really tricky because yeah. a lot of people were hurting, especially last year. People are still hurting, but it's expressed differently. Well, then there's COVID. So, and, um, <laughs> and then COVID on top of that, which is, yeah. you know, it has been a very difficult year for Hong Kong. Yeah. And I guess one of the things that I struggle with with the work for Yama Foundation is that for the most part, a lot of our work in prisons and care homes were just instantly suspended. Yeah. Nobody is allowed in, nobody was allowed out. Um, so there's some government schools, which are boarding schools for kids with profound and multiple disabilities. And a lot of the kids are residing there and they haven't seen their family in months. 
the the homes in Hong Kong are not big. A lot of of the lower income housing, it's not accessible, especially the older ones. So families don't actually physically have the capability to look after their kids. And so our work has been to support the schools that are looking after these kids or provide some sort of a resource. If we can't send the teacher inside, we've been putting a lot of things online. Mm. So suddenly our YouTube channel got very active uh -huh. and we've been offering classes bilingually in English and in Cantonese. Uh -huh. uh, we're looking at subtitling as well for those with hearing impairments. And just, you know, at the moment, that's all we can do is put as many resources online as we can, try to connect through Zoom. We're, we have another program, which is a one-to-one -one yoga therapy for children with special needs. And we had a grant that we received to be able to offer this one-to-one -one because one teacher, one student, you're within social distancing guidelines. The teacher is masked. The student doesn't necessarily have the capability to be masked, which is what makes it really tricky. Yeah. But in that type of a clean, sanitized environment, we could have, we could keep the kids safe. But again, we had a third wave where we were having so many cases a day. And so that had to be suspended. So we're trying Zoom classes. But you can imagine that might not be very successful for a child right. who, who might have an attention deficit disorder yeah. or somebody in a yeah. wheelchair that actually needs physical movement, physical yeah. assistance, I mean. Yeah, that's a challenge here too, is similar. Um, are they having any in-person classes still in Hong Kong? I mean, um, at the moment, the yoga, the yoga studios are closed, but they are soon to open because in Hong Kong, people are very, very good about social distancing and staying home and wearing masks. I mean, it's a very obedient culture. Mm -hmm. So, you know, and we've been through SARS back in 2003. Right. So we know the drill and everybody is very good at social distancing and so in just a few short weeks we were able to bring the new cases right down yeah i noticed that um, more in asia it seemed to asia seemed to recover quicker i think part of it was that experience with mask wearing and social distancing that in the u.s people are still fighting against um even though it could make this go away so much faster you know if we just were more careful you know yeah about not sharing um I'm curious about, I guess, since you're in Hong Kong, you know, maybe even before COVID, like, what was the kind of the status of accessible yoga kind of culturally? Like, and, and even maybe, I don't know if you could speak to Asia more broadly, if that's possible. Just, I'm just curious, like, where, you know, wh like, how is yoga perceived there? Is it similar to here where it's very much um, physical practice and not definitely Yeah. Definitely, definitely. When I came to Hong Kong and I started to do the work for kids with special needs, it was it was like yoga. No, wait, but you, I don't think you understand what my child has. Like my child can't do yoga, and I was like, actually, your child can. And it was a big, um, a huge challenge when I first started my work back in two thousand and nine. When I moved back to Hong Kong. To the point where it was like, well, because people, I mean, most of the marketing out there, especially in Hong Kong, yoga is anti-aging, yoga is slimming, yoga is, you know, they're beautiful billboards of gorgeous people, very handsome South Indian men or beautiful Chinese women in impossible poses. And so that's all people knew yoga to be. We're very complicated asana. Not even tree pose. Tree pose was not, you know, that's just too basic. Yeah. You know, and you see these billboards still to this day all over Hong Kong and all the local marketing is all about contortionism. Yeah. And it's very exciting. 
And this is, you know, I have a lot of people in the West come to Hong Kong and they're like, this is intense on a whole different level. And one of the things in class, it's very difficult to accommodate people who can't touch their toes. And so I walked into this space seeing such a huge need and trying to define myself in Hong Kong as saying yoga is for people who have disabilities, but you had to, I had to inch my way in. So I started a series of classes called yoga for the absolutely inflexible, no toe touching required. And that kind of got a little bit of traction. And from there, I started to teach prenatal yoga and kids yoga. And actually, my prenatal yoga experience was very, very valuable to the point where I saw, you know, pregnant, what we see in the media are pregnant yogis who are already quite advanced, Mm -hmm. showing beautiful poses to maintain their pre-pregnancy practice. Whereas in reality, when I went through both my pregnancies, I gained a ton of weight. Mm -hmm. I had mobility issues. I had joint issues. I I mean, you name it, I had it. Bleeding nose, bleeding gums, the least glamorous pregnancy. Mm -hmm. So all those wonderful yoga selfies I had planned in my head were out. And I started to create this new system based on what I learned. Because my prenatal training, although it was wonderful spiritually, physically it didn't address joint instability And actually, it needs to be a rehabilitative process from the get-go to prepare you on how to heal quickly after you've had the child. So that became a huge project of mine to the point where now I've got my own teacher training program. And that's accessible prenatal? Accessible prenatal. And it's designed for women who don't have glamorous pregnancies. And okay. it is... Are there glamorous in, pregnancies? I don't know. Uh, well, there's some. There are definitely okay. some. And it's for women who are, you know, they're just uncomfortable in their bodies. And I think one thing about pregnancy is that is different from yoga is in regular yoga, you see your range of motion and your strength upward, like improving. But with pregnancy, as you get bigger... Mm-hmm. That range of motion, (laughs) it just goes like, oh. So you're moving towards limited mobility until you actually have the baby. And it needs to be accommodating of that. So this is the second point that I came where, and this is where I started putting a lot of chair yoga in. And then where kids would have issues, like developmental issues. I studied for many years with Sonia Sumar, And she does yoga for the special child. Mm -hmm. And two parents was like, well, I don't know what else to do with my child. So why don't we just try yoga? Mm -hmm. And it was more out of, well, no other activity in Hong Kong will take the child. So let's try yoga. And the results were outstanding. Mm -hmm. There's something specifically for kids who have autism. They resonate with Sanskrit mantras. And I I can't even explain it, but there's something there in that practice that they understand. And then with the asana and with the breathing and with the meditation. And so I started in these little pockets. I volunteered as an educational assistant at a special educational school just to learn and meet more kids and work with them. And this is where it all kind of came together a few years ago when I started Yama Foundation, because there are so many people that need access to yoga and not spend 300, like 40 US dollars for a drop in class. When was that? When was it that you started Yama? Uh, I founded it officially in 2016. But the idea was about 2010, 2011. But of course, I had just had my second child. So it took a while to bring that into fruition. Yeah. 
So this is, this is kind of the work. Um, still today in Hong Kong, yoga is not, I wouldn't say accessible. Yoga studios aren't accessible. There's plenty of yoga studios that I've been invited to teach in, but it's simply the space is not wheelchair friendly. You know, there's stairs to get up into the studio yeah. or the elevator space is not enough. And this is, this is where we face life in Hong Kong. Yeah. And so we've well, that's true in a through, lot of places. Yeah. yeah. That's the but norm, it is, unfortunately. It is, but it's better in the West. Hmm. Okay. I don't um, know, like Hong in Kong Europe, as a was, city. Europe is really bad. A lot of European cities, maybe because they're older, the buildings are not really yeah. accessible. So you see that often. Um, sometimes in the U.S. in urban environments, it's similar. They might be, like I was in Toronto. That's in Canada, obviously, but there was, I couldn't find a single accessible studio. Yeah, yeah and it's hard. So many. Yeah. So I'm really lucky, actually. I'm in uh, one of my students' yoga studios that she owns. It's called the Mira Center. Mm. And this is fully accessible. That's awesome. You know, you can stop the car right outside. It's not on a busy street. So if you have a wheelchair-friendly car, roll right in, come up. There's an accessible toilet. It's very nice. That's great. Yeah. And what are your plans? Like, do you... Uh, I mean, I think COVID probably changed everything, but... It has. We've had to pivot a lot of our um, classes and training. So the work I did with teacher trainings, it simply just moved it online. Carrying on the trainings via Zoom. I've had to cancel a bunch of them because some people don't yeah. want online. They want in person, and that is totally understandable. Uh, but now, instead of growing my teacher trainings, I'm actually making them more intimate. So smaller studios, smaller intake. Mm. I think that actually works, you know, and moving, moving stuff online as well. Mm -hmm. And I guess if you take the rental cost out, because rents are very high in Hong Kong, <laughs> right. Right. then you can also make it more affordable. So this is, this is where I've been at with the work, with the trainings. And with Yama, we're still struggling. It's a day-to-day. -day. Yeah. You know, most of the poor communities and the marginalized communities, they don't have access to tech. Right. So yeah. to so stream a class, it's not that accessible. Hmm. So we're looking at partnering with some of the other charities and NGOs in Hong Kong that are focused on working with telecoms or raising money to get those data SIM cards or Wi-Fi hotspots out into families, this would be really good. Wow, that'd be amazing. And so if we can, you know, obviously we'll have to pause our work, support their work, and then come back with our classes. Mm, I see. I've heard of some places maybe like um, where the residential facilities that sometimes there's like a group, like a television they would watch as a group or something and that you could potentially get a class on screen. I don't know if that's possible there. I've heard of some places doing that in the US like um, senior centers or nursing homes who want to bring yoga in and it's not safe to bring, you know, to actually go right. in there yet. Um, they're showing classes especially if it's with a teacher they know already then it seems more um that's actually know. what we have done yeah. so we've actually spent the money to get a professional film crew in to mm. film a series of classes wow. so the um we have a art in your life yoga in your heart program mm. and this is expressive arts and yoga therapy for kids with special needs and rare diseases and this was where we were going into the government boarding schools to ha like on mass to have a big group class so the kids could practice together. But each student had a yoga teacher to work with them. So it was a group class with individual attention. But what we did was we made a series of six videos, which we've recently just put on our YouTube channel. 
Oh, wow. And the schools are going to be broadcasting that on the screen. And they're, we've heard that they're going to be sending it home to the other parents as part of the online learning. That's awesome. Because everybody's being homeschooled. So that's really great. And wow. the same thing, we've done a lot of filming for other care homes. Wow. That's so that's, that's how we've managed. Are those in English? Uh, they're, they're bilingual. They're bilingual. Okay. Mostly, so, mostly in Cantonese, though, because that's okay, the, so the language say, that needs to be spoken. We can put some of the links uh, here in this um, chat later. I can add uh, a link to the accessible prenatal training. Oh, yes, and, definitely. Um, and then maybe, I don't know if you have a link to your YouTube, you can, or you can add it yourself. Um, yeah, okay. For people okay. to go watch. Is that public? Yeah, it's a public. Okay. All right. But then I, I had a slightly different question for you. I, I like to talk to you about philosophy. So I think, yes. I just don't know if we could shift slightly because I think it's okay. a topic that you and I both enjoy. Mm -hmm. I mean, you can add it. Do you want to do it now? We can add it later. Um, I can add it later. I'll add it later. Yeah. Um, yeah, I guess I'm just curious about that, about maybe your take on kind of the idea of accessibility and um, as a philosophical concept in yoga. Like, we just talk about the, can, I wonder if you could talk about that, like kind of like a, the basis of not just accessibility, but maybe broader, um, I don't know if we could broaden it to social justice in general, but there's just this idea of, um, of fairness and human rights and where we see that reflected in the yoga teachings? Because that's something I've been thinking about. And so I'm just curious yeah. what your take is. It's like I'm doing research for my book right now, by the way, by asking you. Oh, brilliant. <laughs> <laughs> very excited for that one, too. I think it's very, very important to look at the essential teachings of yoga and the philosophy of what it teaches you. Yeah. You know, if we look around, our whole world is full of, you know, as, as our guru actually taught us, the, the world is a university. Everybody is a teacher. Those that want teach you how to be and those that teach you how not to be. And our whole role in practicing yoga as seekers is to realize the impermanence of everything and rise above it. But that doesn't mean spiritually bypass it. And I think a lot of people use that in the world of yoga yeah. to avoid a lot of discomfort. And the practice is to actually go into that discomfort within your capacity. You sh obviously, you're not going to go into a lion's den if you don't know how to train a lion. So the first thing is to start with yourself and really look at, honestly, our biases and our judgments. I grew up in colonial Hong Kong. I was embarrassed of my Indian heritage. And I westernized myself as much as possible to fit in in high school. But after a while, once you've established your friendships and everything, I realized I actually didn't have to minimize that side of me. Mm -hmm. Because one of the things I loved to do was classical Indian dancing. Right. And my group of friends embraced that. So when you have the world the way it is, especially with what's been happening in the West, in the US, yeah. in Hong Kong, it's important to stand up for what is not right. It's important to stand up for what is not right. Keeping in mind that you have to go at your own capacity. And it's our job in our practice to figure out what that capacity is. And it is, I think, about finding what that purpose is within. And we can all lead by example. Is that kind of... Can you give um, a teaching, like, is there a specific place maybe that you see that expressed in the teachings? Like, is there, like, I was thinking about, you know, your foundation as a Yama foundation and 
you mentioned yama is the first limb um, of ashtanga yoga and i wonder if that's you know we have ahimsa and satya uh, so ahimsa yeah yeah um non-violence is obviously <coughs> the most important and violence you know most of us think of violence like oh i don't rob anybody i don't punch anybody yeah. i don't you know i'm a vegan but it's so much deeper than that. Any sort of casting a judgment, any sort of I am better than you, that is violence. And that is fully in breach of what accessible yoga is about. And especially as a yoga teacher, we are here to serve. And this is something that is so important to me, especially in my practice is you know, somebody comes to me, I am not in this position of a teacher. I am actually in a position of a servant. Hmm. And this is where karma yoga comes into play, ahimsa, because this is an opportunity as a yogi to serve. Yogis are not supposed to be grand. We're supposed to be humble. <laughs> oh, oops. <laughs> <laughs> you know, and, and as, as glamorous as our industry has, actually, it, it's, it has very humble roots. We're supposed to be the servants of the earth. Mm. And in the practice, it's, you know, yeah. these thankless jobs, right? Like leaving a public toilet nicer than how you find it. Mm. That, to me, is yoga. So when you are following the principles of ahimsa, satya, asteya, brahmacharya, aparigraha, it's about being kind, being truthful, not being a coward. And I think a lot of people use this excuse of being peaceful to avoid conflict and confrontation. And again, to me, that's spiritual bypassing. Yeah. Can you say more about that? Because I, I agree. I just don't know if people know what that is. Um, spiritual so bypassing. spiritual bypassing is this concept where we take the teaching of non-attachment as an excuse not to deal with something. Mm -hmm. And we, we think we are above it. But actually, we are not. And this comes where we ignore injustices. That's a huge one, ignoring exactly. injustices that happen. Right. Sometimes they, we not just, maybe it's not always non-attachment, it could be um, concepts like um, non-duality, this idea of oneness. I see that used a lot as for, in spiritual bypassing, you know, in mm -hmm. saying, oh, we're all one. You know, like, I don't see color, we're all one. When you're talking about racism, that's a form of spirit. Right. Like because you're basically denying the reality of people's experience. I mean, yoga actually is a dualistic philosophy, at least Patanjali's yoga. Right. Um, right. And he does talk about transcending that duality when you're enlightened. But while we're here not enlightened, we have this duality, right, where there's the spirit and then there's your body mind that is having a very human experience and can be suffering. Um, and so by saying we're all one, I don't see color, you're kind of denying the fact that someone else may be suffering and you're not having compassion for them. And that is a kind right. of harm. That's a kind of violence to actually exactly. not, exactly. right, to not be trying to reduce other people's suffering. Exactly. And I think in, in this context, if you call yourself a yogi or a student of yoga, you need to be very aware of the words that come out of your mouth, are you opening a conversation? Are you shutting somebody down? Even in your classes, regardless of whether it's about race or not, are you shutting somebody down or are you holding their space and truly listening to them and seeing them as they are? And I think this is where spiritual bypassing comes and you know, making these blanket statements of, I don't see statements, we're all one, 
if somebody is telling you they actually don't feel that you're warm in your yoga class or they feel excluded. Yeah. It's very brave for somebody to come up and say that. You can imagine yeah. how much internal nervousness they had to come yeah. to actually say something. Yeah. And I think our job is to hold that space, hear it, acknowledge it, and then begin yeah. a conversation. We don't have to have all the answers. I see it sometimes just on um, social media. I see like um, people saying yoga is about social justice. It's just, it's, you know, like stay in your lane. Um, I saw there's an article that uh, it printed in yoga journal about that, about yoga as social justice. And then the comments were just shocking, you know, just like, no, it's not. Yoga is about peacefulness. It's about um, connecting with myself. It's all these things that people were saying really just denying, denying this reality of yoga as really a service, like you said, you know, that yoga off the mat. It's like, sure, your practice might be a time for you to connect with yourself and be peaceful and whatever you need to do in that space. And I think people get defensive of that kind of sanctuary that they create there, even though that is mm. important that you have that. But the minute you step off that mat, then yoga continues. No, and yoga is yeah. meant to live in the real world. Thank it's you. like yeah. that wonderful story of um, the the guy who said, I'm renouncing the world and I'm going yeah. to learn and seek enlightenment. And he goes, lives in a cave and meditates for five years. And he finds peace inside the cave. Obviously, you don't have to deal with people. And then he comes out of the cave and he goes back to his village and he's like, I am enlightened. I know the secret to peace. And his brother's like, really? I don't believe it. And he's like, no, no, no. Yes, I know it. I know. And it's like, yeah, but you were such an angry person before. And you couldn't handle it before. And he's like, no, I'm telling you, I'm enlightened. I'm enlightened. And the brother kept asking and pushing those buttons and pushing those buttons. And he's like, you ask. I am enlightened. <laughs> what happened to your piece now? Yeah. And this is so related I to I love hearing you tell that story totally different than I do, by the way. <laughs> that was awesome. I tell that same story. That was awesome. I mean, look, it's like when I come out of the ashram and I'm like all peaceful. Uh -huh. And then I come back to my family and it becomes very overwhelming. That's the real practice. Maintaining. Yes. I think, is it Jack Hornfield who wrote about that? Um, you know, in his famous book, I don't know what it was, but he, he was like, he was, he went and lived as a monk in India or something, or in, maybe he was a Buddhist monk somewhere, I don't know, in Asia. Then he came back to like New York City for his sister's wedding and they like went shopping at like Bloomingdale's together. And he said within like 15 minutes of being with his family shopping in Bloomingdale's, he had lost all the peace that he'd found, you know, after years in this, you know, ashram mm -hmm. in, in India or something. So. Absolutely. When I was living in New York City, I was having a bad week at work. And I called Swami Satchidananda. And I was like, oh, I'm so stressed. I need to come to Yogaville so I can get some peace. And he, I was expecting some sympathy. And he was like, peace? Peace? You can't find peace here. If you can't find peace inside your own mind, you won't find any peace. Don't come. <laughs> And That's obviously, awesome. the days after a series of events happened that made me actually understand what he was trying to say. That peace has to start. Yes, it has to start inside of you. But then what? What is the point? But it's not, but I was going to say, connecting to the bypassing, it's not that that peace is going to happen inside of you because you've turned away and, and ignored everything. You've learned how to process it, right? You've learned how to like, respond and i think that's yoga it's not like what i see bypassing is this effort to like shut it shut it down like good vibes only you know that one yeah. that whole like good vibes only is actually not yoga that's that's bypass y yoga is about i can deal with whatever i'm faced with like my i i'm responsible for my response that's all i can be responsible for is absolutely my response. and that's what my practice and, is Exactly, exactly. And once you, once you have a grasp of that 
inner peace and you know, okay, you found it in an ashram and you know the formula to get there, then you have to go out into the world and reapply that formula and hold the space without saying, nope, good vibes only because you're denying the real world. So I teach a lot of kids yoga. Yeah. And one of my favorite children's storybooks is uh, we're going on a bear hunt. Okay. Um, and it's a family who are going on a bear hunt. And then they come into thick, oozy mud and they say, we can't go over it. We can't go under it. We have to go through it. And to me, this is the essence of yoga practice. You can't bypass it. Can't go over it. You can't go under it. You have to go through it. Mm. And it's this hard. is hard to do. Yeah, it's well. That's the beauty of life. We have every moment to practice. Mm. That's awesome. No, every every moment to practice. For all those oh. family members that push your buttons, and if you yell, and you go back and you reflect and you say, "Oh, that wasn't very yogic of me. That was bad." Well, that's so beauty. You have next week's family dinner to try again. Yeah. I think I think your husband's watching, by the way. Oh, great. <laughs> so he'll probably call you out on that one. He's my best He's teacher. My best teacher. <laughs> anyway, that's funny. Yeah. Yeah, so, yeah. exactly. Yeah. This is, you know, life is not meant to be perfect life is messy and complicated life is impermanent so what can we do now to make it sweeter and it's not just about for ourselves only we share this planet so if we come out of that selfish mindset and look at okay well how do we make the world a little sweeter for everyone for me, it's about looking at those who are the most marginalized in Hong Kong, using whatever tools and experience I've had in this lifetime to give back. In this case, it's yoga. But it doesn't have to be. You know, I have a friend who's a hairstylist. And he goes around giving free haircuts to the homeless. So it's, it's whatever you can do in your capacity to make the world and the experience, not just for yourself, but for those around you sweeter. Sweeter. I like that. Yeah. That's awesome. Thank you. Yeah. Thanks, Anything Thank else you, you want to you. share with us? Anything else you want to talk about? Mm, uh, how are we for time? I mean, oh, we could okay. end soon. Yeah, yeah, we could wrap it up. Yeah. Um, no, I'm just really, really grateful. Really grateful to chat to you, Jeev, and I'm excited for your upcoming book. <laughs> Me too. I have to write it. I have to finish writing it. Yeah. Oh. Um, you know, I guess if I were to leave on some closing message, it would be really take every moment to look after those you love and try with an open heart to understand those that don't share the same opinions as you. Hmm. That's great really advice. try to embrace that. That's beautiful. Do you want to end with a little closing something? Because that feels like you opened. Do you want to do like a little mantra? Yes, I first? would. So all my yoga classes, I've been opening and closing with the same one. Just because with COVID yeah. around the world. Yeah. Let's this is again. the most important. Okay. okay. And will you put in those um, uh, links to the to the chat later? On Into Facebook? this chat, yeah. I'll put on it on Facebook. the Facebook. I'll put it on Facebook. On Facebook. Yes. Okay. 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 Alright. Thank you. Oh. Trayambakam yajamahe Sugandhim pushtivardhanam Urvarukamiva pandhanam Rityor mokshiya mamrita
ओम शांति 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 लोक समस्त सुखिनो भवंतु May the whole world be filled with peace, joy, love, and light. Thank you. Om Shanti. Thank you. Om Shanti. Om Shanti. Thank, Thank you, you so Rachel. much, Devana. Thank you. Take care. Have a good day. You too. You too. We're still, we're still Friday. But. <laughs> <laughs> Thank, you. Thank you. All right. Take care. Take care. Thank Bye. you. Bye.